now move on to the work of a unique organization about which little is generally known. It's a body that has purposely kept a low profile, preferring to concentrate on what it sees as its central task, research into the field of race relations and actions stemming from that research. Paula Aluwalia coaxed enough time from them to allow us to make the film report that follows. Located in the modest surroundings of the King's Cross area of London is the Institute of Race Relations. Relying its wealthy origins when it was first set up in the late 1950s, it operates from a converted warehouse. Siva, what was the Institute of Race Relations originally set up to do? It was set up to study the relations between races in an objective, scientific manner. And at the time that it was set up, it was in the early 50s, this applied to the new emerging nations of the world, the third world countries. But uh, essentially, to case the joint, so to speak, of the newly emerging countries for the prospects of businesses in the present setup. So where did the money come from? Nafil Foundation was one of the original supporters of the Institute. It was before it became the Institute of Race Relations, but it was a department of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. And then subsequently, Shell put in some money to make uh, some sort of research into tropical African countries. Um, and after that, Ford Foundation stepped in. Uh, Rockefeller was there in, at the early stages somewhere. So it was the big foundations that gave the money to the Institute at that stage. Yes, well, it began as a very, very establishment body indeed, funded by extremely wealthy um, corporations and ostensibly taking a neutral line. Uh, nobody really believed this, but the theory was that it was possible to gather facts about race without taking up any kind of political positions, which, of course, was nonsense, but that was the, that was the, the myth. And it began as, as a very, very respectable body uh, to, to gather facts, uh, about uh, black people and about race and about discrimination uh, and it was uh, precluded by its charter from taking up any uh, positions about anything and uh, that was the beginning, it was an offshoot of the Royal Institute for International Affairs and then it moved to uh, German Street and I think that was very symbolic really that it was there in uh, Millionaire's Row in fact in the heart of the, the really wealthy part of the West End uh, very very well financed indeed and then of course um, you got within the Institute a growing group of people who felt unhappy with this and felt that um, there was something absurd and immoral in uh, pretending that you can take a neutral line on something so important as racism. In the first instance, race relations up to 1958 was something that obtained in other parts of the world. And racism was something that obtained, let us say, in the United States of America. But Britain was clean, was pure, was free of all. It was virginal. That was the myth. But by 1958, when Macmillan was just beginning to say that we never had it so good, and we were having it pretty bad. By that point, the call for labor began to fall off. And when the riots took place in Notting Hill and Nottingham, the profit that the enterprises, private enterprise could make on the basis of exploiting black labor had to be weighed against the social dislocation caused not by the presence of black people, but by the presence of white attitudes towards black people within the country. When those attitudes became translated into acts of racial discrimination, into housing, in employment, in schooling, it became even more difficult to talk about race relations. When those acts then finally became institutionalized in the apparatuses of the state, beginning with the Race Relations Act of 1962, the Immigration Act of 1962, then you begin to have state-sponsored racism. So the subject no longer becomes race relations but racism. But the 58 riots brought the imperial chickens home to roost. And that pointed to the Institute that the research on race relations had now had to be made on Britain itself. 
the contradictions became subtle, and the staff had to decide whether they were a part of the problem of racism or a part of the solution to racism. And that was the beginning of a movement to change the institute from within. It represented the institute rejecting its um, old shell of neutrality and, and leaving it behind and saying from now on, uh, this institute is uh, not to be a neutral fact-gathering body, but a body which uh, systematically analyzes and opposes racism in society and seeks to be a resource for and the voice of the black community. When that sort of split in an institution arises, usually what happens is that the radicals go out through the back door and leave the institution to the respectables. What happened in this case is that the, the radicals, so to speak, said there's no reason why we should give up the resources because it's the, the people out there who need them. So we're going to hold on to the resources and the place and the credibility and the name and make it available to new kinds of people. It was a democratic decision, but it was a very bold move to make. And it was, in effect, a kind of hijack of the resources that had been built up in the, in the institution, transferring them to a less exalted and respectable setting, and saying to ordinary people, here are resources available for you to come and study your own problems. We felt that we had become the custodians of the Institute's philosophy, of the Institute's original principles. We were the custodians of the tenets that the Institute had said it was going to follow where it was first set up. Objectivity, truth, non-bias. The council had defected from those qualities, from those tenets. We therefore felt that it is the council that had to leave and not ourselves. And a series of battles fought over the two things, over the editorship of race today and over the right of staff to criticize the products that their researchers made over those two things, a battle went on from 1969 to 1972. It was a long process. And it finally came to a head when Sandy Kirby, the editor of Race Today, was sacked from the journal. At that point, the staff decided that it must organize itself in terms of the members of the Institute of Race Relations, who basically elected the council. But for years, right up to 1969, the members of the council had become self-perpetuating. And these members of the council were the lords of humankind, Oppenheimer, of South African Consolidated Gold Mines, uh, Seaboom of Barclays Bank, DCNO, Michael Caine of Booker Brothers, who owned at one time half of then British Guiana. Uh, we had a whole series of businessmen, Uncle Toms, uh, MPs, Labour MPs who were radicals abroad and conservatives at home holding up the Institute of Race Relations for businessmen, for the state, against the black people. It was, in a sense, a peric victory. We lost a whole lot of staff whom we couldn't afford to pay, and we lost a whole lot of money which, by which the library and other services of the Institute began to suffer. But, on the other hand, we became a leaner, sparer, more relevant institute. What I learned through the struggle at the Institute was that the problem wasn't black people, but white people. The problem wasn't race relations as such, but racism, institutional racism, which was a white problem. But it was white society we should be researching and exposing. And that's what we've tried to do since then in all the work of the Institute. For example, one day, uh, a black man who I didn't know at the time, I've learnt his name later as Brother Herman of the Harambi Project, he walked into my office, which was above the Chelsea Cobbler in Sackville Street, and he said, could we, as researchers, the people with the skills, help him to find out about something called SUS? Now, this was 1970. We hadn't heard of SUS. We didn't know what he was talking about. He wanted to know if we could find out for him, because we had the skills, the difference of rates between black people and white people picked out on SUS. We didn't understand this man. He didn't fit into the type of research we were doing. We sent him on his way. I mean, six years later, research has been done into SUS. Now SUS has been repealed. Okay, something else has been put in its place. But I was trying to explain how totally irrelevant we were to the concerns of black people in the early 70s. The research that the Institute of Race was doing on black communities within Britain, on the difficulties faced by black communities, and the type of advice that the Institute was indirectly giving the government, or substantiating government policies with the type of research that it did, was in direct contradiction 
to the type of information that was received in the library of the institute via its press cuttings from every single newspaper in the country. The institute, which was supposed to be objective, scientific, and truthful, was neither objective nor scientific nor truthful. It was lying in terms of the actual empirical data that we had to hand. The library is a fantastic resource for the black community and for the sort of struggle against racism. Um, in academic library professional terms, it numbers some 10,000 books, some 20,000 pamphlets, around 400 current journals. It um, has material, rare material, which you won't find anywhere else. It covers uh, everything to do with race relations, racism, imperialism, migrant workers, um, on a worldwide basis, so it doesn't just cover Britain, but the United States, Southern Africa, and um, Asia, etc. In fact, um, we used to say that the library is unique in Europe. I've come here to, to Britain this year to do research and have based myself at the Institute because the Institute has a fairly unique collection of materials. Now, behind me are these journals. And race and class, the, the journal of the Institute, um, is linked with, you, with each of these journals, at least by an exchange. And it provides here, then, a collection of materials which you cannot find elsewhere. And it, as well, provides access to these materials for people who would not ordinarily be found in a university library or even most of your, your public libraries. And what about the archive material? Well, the archive material is particularly interesting to me because I'm doing, I'm doing historical research. And again, not merely for those of us who are in university or are doing academic public publishing or academic research, but for, for people who want to have a, um, a better sense. School children, um, working or jobless adults, who want to have a better sense of what of what kinds of things have occurred before. I'm a teacher, a lecturer, and my students would come back to my classrooms and tell me that they'd been speaking to people at a place called the Institute, in particular to a man called Sivanandan, using the library here. And so eventually I had to come here. And I got involved from another direction because I have a political practice. Anybody who's black and cares in this country has to have a political practice. Uh, I was a publisher myself in literature about the black condition, situation in this society. And so I got to know the Institute's work in that, in that way too. And so it was inevitable that one day I would come into the Institute. There were church people involved in the Institute from the beginnings. But uh, about 1968, you got a very major change in the international reaction of the church to racism. And this took the form of the setting up by the World Council of Churches of a body called the Programme to Combat Racism. And uh, putting it very simply, this was a programme uh, which took the view that uh, if the church is really to take opposition to racism seriously, then it must put its money where its mouth is. And so a major part of the programme has been funding. And uh, the Institute has been one of the bodies in Britain um, which has benefited from the, um, the grants made by the PCR, as we call it. The Institute is part of black resistance in this society. Uh, we don't say that very frequently publicly. We say we, we, we service. We don't talk about being part of it. But I am saying, as chairman, as someone who came from the outside, that it is part of. Uh, most of the time, black people in this society, in this racist society, are having, uh, have their heads down struggling hard against all the, the evidences of racism. The Institute attempts to hold her head up, if you like, and to try to analyze the situation that we're in to inform a better practice the next time round. And in that sense, it is a part. If you ask me what the role is, it provides that kind of service uh, in the main. Of course, there are other things on the ground. It, uh, it has a library service, it provides information, it investigates, it publishes, it, it, it helps uh, with educational practice in the society and so on. But if you are asking me as, a, as an activist uh, institute what its role was, I'd say that it, was, it, it helped in the way that I just described. It was the radicals who said that lots of people here who are into the race research game really for prestige or academic purposes, but they aren't thinking about the social content and the political function of what they're doing. What was important about the new people is that they had a political purpose for the Institute, and they've really made it into a new kind of thing as a result of that. 
I think a lot of people, for instance, don't know that the Institute has given evidence of an important kind to official inquiries, to Scarman, to the, uh, the study of police procedures, criminal procedures, and so on. And I think it's very important that the Institute can still, in a sense, represent a point of view at that serious level and be taken seriously. What's your view of the Institute's journal, Race and Class? Race and Class is a very important journal. There are many other journals, of course, which take the problems of race at their, uh, as their focus. But Race and Class is, I think, the most serious, the most analytic, theoretical journal in the field. And the first thing that it's done is it's commanded the respect of other academics and intellectuals. They don't have to agree with it, but they just have to read it if they want to stay in the field. But secondly, it also uh, is a journal which, while being serious and so on, does contribute to practice. It's not afraid at the end of an article of saying, that's the analysis, now what politics follows from this, or what's the implications for policy as a result of that. It's not an ethereal or abstract journal in that sense. What is important for us is to strengthen the struggles of black people. We are not necessarily a grassroots organization. Our business is to put gas into the tanks of black people on their way to liberation. We are a servicing station. It's very important that we have a body which is not sponsored by the Home Office, which is not the voice of the establishment, which is not simply concerned to uh, keep things calm, but is concerned to speak the truth and to be an independent and critical voice, and I think this is what the Institute has been and, and uh, hopefully will continue to be. When you have a non-neutral situation, when everything is loaded against black people, to redress that imbalance is an act of balance. That is the number of justice, isn't it? Paula Aluwalia, looking at the work of the Institute of Race Relations. You may be interested to know that to mark the 10th anniversary of the Reformed Institute, a book of Sivanandan's writings called A Different Hunger has been published recently by Pluto Press.